This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. I am sitting in solidarity with all the folks experiencing debilitating humidity. It'll get worse before it gets better, but the sweating will bring us together. Emotionally, not physically. Here's what we got for y'all. Tonight, a preview of the president's first major trip overseas as commander in chief. Plus new calls for a tougher US stance on Israel after weeks of violence claimed hundreds of lives. But first, here's what you need to know right now. A new Senate report points out multiple failures leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol and places blame directly on the intelligence community and law enforcement. The 127 page report is the result of bipartisan Senate committees and includes information from hearings, interviews, and documents. Some of the big takeaways, the intelligence community failed to issue a threat assessment of the potential for violence at the Capitol on January 6th. The Capitol Police weren't prepared to deal with the violence. And all of that led to a delayed request for and response from the National Guard. The report also says that there was plenty of communication online between would-be attackers about infiltrating the Capitol's tunnel systems. Capitol Police leadership knew about that, but not everyone was made aware because of the quote, decentralized nature of intelligence resources. Basically, intel folks weren't talking to each other. But the report's scope is limited, and what's not there is just as notable as what is included. For one, the term insurrection or insurrectionists only appear in footnotes and direct quotes, leaving open questions about the attack's motives. Not only that, but the report avoids going into detail about former President Trump's role in all of this. A congressional aide told CNN that the committees didn't look into that or any of the factors that led up to the attack. The committees behind the report had a few recommendations the Capitol Police leadership should be allowed to ask for help directly from the DC National Guard, the Capitol Police should improve their training overall, and that intelligence agencies should review how they assess these kinds of threats. With all these recent cyber attacks, there's a debate over whether a target should be paying a ransom. And today, the CEO of Colonial Pipeline, who did pay up, defended his decision to Congress. It was the hardest decision I've made in my 39 years in the energy industry. And I know how critical our pipeline is to the country. And I put the interests of the country first. This week, the Justice Department's newly launched ransomware and digital extortion task force announced it actually recovered part of that ransom. Basically, federal investigators found a virtual currency wallet used by the dark side hackers and tracked it through more than 20 electronic accounts. This work is important because every day, the digital threats that we face are more diverse, more sophisticated, and more dangerous. The FBI was able to recover about 85% of the Bitcoin included in the ransom. That payment was originally worth around $4 million, but since the value of cryptocurrency has recently dropped, the recovered Bitcoin ended up being worth just over $2 million. Gotta love that cryptocurrency volatility, right? In a heavy blow to online organized crime, authorities arrested at least 800 people across more than a dozen countries. The three-year investigation was dubbed Operation Trojan Shield by the FBI, and the name is pretty fitting. See, the criminals thought they were using a secure messaging platform called ANOM on devices obtained through the black market. Turns out it was actually run by the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, so basically they had access to every message sent on the platform. More than 12,000 encrypted devices used by more than 300 criminal syndicates operating in more than 100 countries. Criminals trusted the platform so much they didn't even try to code their messages. Instead, they laid out plans clearly and even sent pictures. We were able to actually see photographs of hundreds of tons of cocaine that were concealed in shipments of fruit. But it wasn't just drug crimes. Authorities in Australia said they prevented one mass shooting and more than 20 murder plots. Altogether, Trojan Shield is one of the largest and most sophisticated law enforcement operations in history. After months of exclusively domestic travel, President Biden is taking his first international trip during his time in office. He'll meet with allies, partners, and Putin during his week abroad. Newsy's Willie James Inman tells us more about what to look for during Biden's first foreign trip. President Joe Biden will use his first overseas trip in office as a chance to restart friendships with European and NATO allies after four years of tense relations under former President Donald Trump. 
And the trip, at its core, will advance the fundamental thrust of Joe Biden's foreign policy, to rally the world's democracies to tackle the great challenges of our time. The president is scheduled to attend the G7 summit in Cornwall, England, from June 11th to the 13th. We're ending the pandemic, providing assistance for developing nations, and corporate taxes will be at the top of the agenda. After that wraps, he and the First Lady will meet with Queen Elizabeth II at Windsor Castle. From June 14th to the 15th, President Biden will attend a NATO summit in Brussels, Belgium, where talks are likely to focus on countering Russia and the ongoing drawdown of forces in Afghanistan. And the last day of his trip will include a stop in Geneva, Switzerland, for a highly anticipated one-on-one -on -one meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Joe Biden is not meeting with Vladimir Putin despite our country's differences. He's meeting with him because of our country's differences. There is simply a lot we have to work through. The high-stakes sit-down with Putin comes amid recent ransomware attacks on U.S. companies by Russian-based criminals and continued political interference in U.S. elections. The White House has consistently said they are working to have a stable and predictable relationship with the Russian leader. What he has to do is he has to establish where we are diplomatically, economically, and militarily with our allies before he goes in and starts talking to Vladimir Putin. I think that really sets the groundwork for what he can do diplomatically, what uh, cards he can play. As a veteran of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when he was in Congress, now President Joe Biden is known to some of the world leaders he will be meeting with. But the week-long trip will be his first face-to-face -face with many since the start of the pandemic. Willie James Inman, Newsy, Washington. Members of the president's own party are pushing for him to get more critical about a longtime ally. Throughout the most recent conflict between Israel's military and Hamas, President Biden reiterated his support for Israel having the right to defend itself, which is what other presidents have also done in the past. But as Newsy Shira Tarlow points out, some Democrats have shifted their tone on Israel and want Biden to do the same. President Biden faces mounting pressure from members of his own party to take a tougher stance on Israel after violence between the Israeli government and Palestinian military group Hamas claimed hundreds of lives and deepened the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. 17 Democratic senators wrote to Secretary of State Antony Blinken, urging him to address the humanitarian emergency in Gaza. The group is led by Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. Progressive House Democrats, including Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, have been longtime critics of the Israeli government and added their voices to the chorus of criticisms. We must, with no hesitation, demand that our country recognize the unconditional support of Israel has enabled the erasure of Palestinians life and the denial of the rights of millions of refugees. And more than 500 former Biden campaign and Democratic Party staffers signed an open letter calling on the president to hold Israel accountable for its actions in the Gaza Strip. This felt like a moment where, you know, we, we could no longer remain silent. Matan Arad Neiman and his colleague Hiba Mohammed helped organize the effort. Both worked on the Biden campaign in 2020. For all of the co-authors of this letter, this is a deeply personal issue. Um, I am Palestinian, and Matan is a Jewish Israeli, and you know, for, for our families who are there, and also just this general sense of justice, we knew this is something that we needed to do. The efforts come as a ceasefire reached last month between Israel and Hamas has so far managed to hold. They highlight a deepening split in the Democratic Party over Israel, even as the U.S.-Israel relationship may appear stronger than ever. Throughout the conflict in Gaza, the Biden administration issued statements supporting Israel's right to self-defense, opposed a UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire, and approved the sale of U.S. arms worth $735 million to Israel. Biden really did seem to want to continue a policy that was certainly um, robust in its defense of Israel's uh, right to self-defense. But uh, we did hear and we did see uh, a lot of 
um, critics on the Democratic side saying, you know, we cannot just give them carte blanche. Brett Bruin served as White House Director of Global Engagement under President Barack Obama from 2013 to 2015. He says with a new government expected to take shape in Israel, the Biden White House will be able to adopt a more neutral stance toward its longtime ally. You saw the Biden administration almost um, hold up as, as a, a, a point of pride that they hadn't given in to the pressure um, from their own party. Temporarily, that may be the case, but longer term, it's going to start to wear on them. And they are going to find that this issue resurfaces and they're going to need to make compromises. They're not going to be able uh, to take such a stridently uh, pro-Israel position. They're going to have to accommodate uh, some of those voices because they're going to need those votes. Publicly, the White House maintains there's been no shift in the U.S.'s position toward Israel. We have a long and abiding relationship, strategic relationship with Israel, and uh, that will continue to be the case uh, no matter who is leading the country. Shira Tarlow, Newsy, Washington. When you're back, we'll tell you how one group is tracking plastics that end up in our waterways. We know there's a problem with plastic and other waste ending up in the country's waterways, but how it gets there and the amount of it has been much harder to track. National reporter Stephanie Stone breaks down a new tool that's meant to follow that pollution and see what's being done with it once it's pulled out of oceans and rivers. It sounds like a pretty walk through a waterway, but it sure doesn't look pretty. That's a lot of trash, and it's just one example of it. A lot of the waste that is generated on land ultimately can end up in the oceans, being brought through wind and rain runoff and rivers and other forms of direct dumping that produces between 19 and 23 million metric tons of plastic waste entering our oceans and lakes and rivers every single year. Sounds like a lot. And it is. That's the equivalent of dumping the water in 23 Olympic-sized swimming pools in plastic waste into the ocean every single day. Molly Morris is a project scientist at UC Santa Barbara's Benioff Ocean Institute. The research group leverages marine science and technology to solve challenges facing oceans and waterways. This is one of those challenges plastic. So much plastic. They're working with partners around the world to figure out how much is out there and where it's coming from. For example, how much plastic pollution is collected in each of these rivers? Um, what types of plastic is it? What is being done with that plastic after we pull it out of the river? Um, is it recycled? Is it put in a sanitary landfill? They have quite a system for tracking that. They're working with nine different river systems around the world, across four continents and nine countries, using things like floating fences and conveyor belts and traps. The data are, the data are coming from how much plastic waste is being captured by the plastic capture systems. Enter Tableau. So we help people see and understand data. Steve Schwartz is in public affairs for the software company, which takes information and helps everyone see it and understand it quickly. And what we can do with data is we can kind of see what's otherwise not seen. Um, and so, you know, in the case of the, the plastic collection, what we're able to see is both the, the negative impact that not taking action is having on these communities, and we're also able to track the positive impact that cleanup is having. The end goal is to use that dashboard for change. Inevitably, a lot of this plastic trash has ended up in the environment and it needs to be cleaned up and somebody has to do that. And so that's really where we feel our niche is being called. It's a complicated problem and we've got a long way to go, but Molly says it's already working, already making a difference. I'm Stephanie Stone reporting. If you haven't done so already, feel free to give us a shout on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the loop. Let me know where y'all are so I know where to crash once my post-pandemic travel takes off.
indigenous people across the country are and have been fighting to protect their sacred land. Now the state of Alaska is protecting an indigenous cemetery that was once a part of a World War II internment site. National reporter Thomas Hopwell has more. Southeast Alaska is mountains carved by glaciers coming right down to sea level. There's mountains, there's really thick trees and forestry, you know, and I'm not used to that. Southeast Alaska is full of beauty and history. Funter Bay is on the northern tip of Admiralty Island on the Mansfield Peninsula, and it's a natural horseshoe-shaped harbor and bay. The story of what happened in Funter Bay is exactly that. That's all you can work on right now, is you can't change what happened there. All you can do is remember it and remember the history. And in these woods, there's something sad and dark that happened to the indigenous Aleut people through Unangan during World War II here in Funter Bay. But in um, 1942, it meant that once the Japanese bombed the Aleutian Islands and the U.S. Army decided that they were going to relocate all the people from the Aleutians and the Pribilofs, Funter Bay became home to, to the people from St. Paul and St. George in a relocation camp. My name is Martin Stepton. I am uh, Unungan Aleut from St. Paul Island. 400 of them, you know, were brought there into the abandoned fish camp, fish cannery that is no longer there as you've seen today. It's not there anymore. Martin's family, along with hundreds of other Unangan people, were taken from their home when the Japanese invaded, forced to live here for two years under inhumane conditions without basic necessities like water. There was no running water. There was no toilets. There was no heating. There was nothing there. The U.S. government did not have um, accurate assessment and did not have a plan for what they would do. This is Alaska Representative Sarah Hannon, who also happens to be a historian. The government technically calls them relocation camps. Everyone who survived them and their families, they call them internment camps um, because they were not allowed to travel freely and they were forced to stay there. 10% of the Aleuts never left Funter Bay. About 30 graves are still here. A lot of people died, you know, a lot of, a lot of sickness happened. And here you have uh, actual Americans that were in horrible, deplorable conditions where a lot of people were dying, where most of the young died and the elderly died due to sickness, starvation, uh, exposure, you know. It was just a lack of care and a lack of, uh, of preparation and uh, very direct um, negligence. Which is why both Martin and Representative Hannon have made the land a priority. The state has passed a bill dedicated to protecting it. To the descendants, a worry is, is resolved. There is no threat that their families' graves would be destroyed, removed. In the sense of history, you don't ever want it to happen again. You want to remember it. We're still capable of treating people like this. You don't have to look far to see us acting like this still. So that's where the value of this history comes into play. And that's where the value of protecting Thunder Bay is, is, is really important. Martin's work isn't done. There are six other sites and graves like this across Alaska, which he hopes can get the same honor and respect. I'm Thomas Hoppo reporting. With more people staying home during the last year, plant sales went through the roof. And maybe the plants themselves did too, depending on how tall yours grew. People think I'm obsessed with this, but I'm okay with it. I am obsessed with it. But the new trend has also exposed a dark side to the plant trade, which is something I didn't think I'd ever say. National reporter Maya Rodriguez explains what's happening with some highly coveted species. Inside the plant shop, B. Willa. Owner 
Liz Veda carefully tends to her livelihood. Plants are the basis of life. But they're also the basis of something else, a lucrative illegal trade in plants poached from the wild, particularly cacti and succulents. If someone's buying a cactus, they need to know that. Out of the more than 1,800 known cactus species, about a third of them are considered endangered. Cacti are found in nearly every U.S. state, with the most varieties found in California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Texas. The vast majority of all cacti in the world can only be found in the Americas, making them highly coveted. Recently, authorities in Italy recovered 1,000 rare cacti poached from the wild in Chile and valued at $1.2 million. Thieves dig the plants up from their native habitats and turn around and sell them, usually online. Upon learning of the plant poaching struggle, Liz decided she and her Baltimore plant shop would do something about it. For me personally, um, as a small growing business, um, my focus initially was very much on kind of how can I bring environmentalism into my work. The illegal trade and poaching of plants is very often overlooked. So Liz reached out to Barbara Getch, a cactus expert with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Liz decided to support our work, and I just find that incredible, right? Because it's she's an entrepreneur, a business benefiting from selling plants, and she wants to return something to those plants. And raise money to return poached plants to where they belong. You know, it was 10% of sales every week. It was this virtual lecture um, portion of specific plant sales, you know, relatively small actions that all work together to affect, you know, actual change. They've raised more than $1,000 so far. Liz says she's also careful to note where the plants she sells come from. I don't stock anything that I can't reliably get from our main suppliers who are, um, you know, selling cultivated plants. And for those in the market to buy greenery, she cautions, do your homework first, especially awesome. when shopping yeah. online. If the plants look weathered or even damaged, that's a red flag. So it's really when you get into uh, independent sellers, people selling on the internet, eBay, Etsy, you know, we don't necessarily see plants in the same way because we just aren't relating to them. You know, they don't have eyes, they don't <laughs> move around, you know, we largely view them as inanimate objects. And I think that is a big risk within the horticultural industry is breaking down that kind of idea that plants are objects. Rather, the living, breathing examples of how Mother Nature can thrive in the harshest of environments. In Baltimore, I'm Maya Rodriguez. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.